So retinoblastoma is what's called a tumor suppressor gene. That's because when a normal copy is present, the ability to form tumors is suppressed. A cell's cell division is suppressed. But when the gene is missing, then a tumor can form. So the two-hit model of cancer initiation says that many cancers are initiated by mutations in genes like the retinoblastoma gene, genes whose normal function is to prevent cell growth. These are what are called tumor suppressor genes. But because these mutant alleles are usually recessive to the normal allele, a tumor is only going to begin to grow if both alleles of this gene are non-functional. That's the two hits. The gene has to take two hits before a tumor will develop, a hit in each allele. So here's that same situation from the perspective of the regulatory interactions diagrams that we used in module four. So I've renamed what we were calling the stop gene, I've named it the RB gene, but the RB gene is functioning as a stop gene. So in um, early in retinal development, the RB gene is inactive and the cells are able to divide. But late in embryonic, late in retinal development, the RB gene becomes active and it shuts down the genes that allow cell division it effectively says, don't grow. If there's a single mutation in one allele of RB knocking it out, doesn't matter, the cell still won't grow. But if both alleles are knocked out, then the RB function is lost and the cell is able to grow. And the cell carries out unregulated growth, causing tumor formation. So, the two-hit model of cancer initiation explains the occurrence of two kinds of family histories, two kinds of retinoblastoma. There are cases that are described as sporadic and cases that are described as familial. In sporadic cases, there's no cases in relatives. There aren't any relatives known to have retinoblastoma. But in familial cases, there are relatives known to have retinoblastoma. And these two kinds of retinoblastoma are approximately equal in frequency, but they're quite different in causation. In both cases, the tumor has suffered two hits. Both its alleles of RB are knocked out. But in sporadic retinoblastoma, the child has inherited two functional RB alleles. And it's only during retinal development that mutations have occurred in both alleles in the same RB cell. In familial cases, the child has inherited one defective allele. So all it's needed to generate the tumor precursor cell is a single somatic mutation in the other allele of any cell in the retina. So here's its diagrammed in a little more detail. In sporadic retinoblastoma, or sporadic occurrences of many other cancers that arise in the same way from inactivation of what's called a tumor suppressor gene, a growth suppressing gene. The child begins with gametes that both carry normal alleles and so the embryo is genetically normal. But two mutations occur during embryonic development in the retinal cell. They have to have occurred in the same cell lineage to produce one cell that has two mutations. This cell then forms rapidly dividing cells that lack retinoblastoma protein and forms a tumor. In familial retinoblastoma, uh, the first hit has already happened in one of the parents, or perhaps earlier, in a grandparent. And one of the gametes carries a defective RB allele. This then results in an embryo that's heterozygous for a mutant allele 
and now it only takes one RB mutation in any cell in the retina to create the tumor precursor cell that will divide and develop into the tumor. Because the RB cells, the mutant cells, grow rapidly, usually the tumor becomes evident during the first year or two of the child's life. Now, there are other ways, factors that distinguish sporadic and familial cancers, um, certainly for retinoblastoma. With sporadic retinoblastoma, the tumor usually develops in only one eye. This makes sense because it's only going to happen in those rare individuals where two RB minus mutations have happened in the same cell lineage. That's very unlikely to occur in both eyes of a per person with a normal genotype. In familial cancer, it usually occurs in both eyes, and that's because the odds of a RB minus mutation happening in one allele in at least one retinal cell are actually very, very high. And so usually people with familial retinoblastoma develop retinoblastoma tumors in both eyes, often more than one tumor in a single eye. People with sporadic retinoblastoma usually don't have any increased risk of other tissues because their other tissues are all genetically normal. But people with familial retinoblastoma may develop cancer in other tissues later. The retina is the most sensitive target and the most sensitive cell that's affected by retinoblastoma mutations. But because the retinoblastoma gene protein has many functions, acts in many cells, cancer can also develop in other cells. Finally, um, you may be wondering about the numbers here. Why would the numbers of sporadic and familial cases be roughly similar when the causes are so different? Well, in familial retinoblastoma, once the single mutation is present, the probability of a mutation in a single retinal, retinal cell is very high. But these alleles, inherited retinoblastoma alleles, are very rare. So we have a very rare event inheriting a retinoblastoma allele and a relatively common event one retinoblastoma mutation happening in one retinal cell in the developing eye. In sporadic cases, everybody else falls into this category. So only one in 100,000, 10,000, 100,000 people falls into this category. Everybody else is in this category. But the chance of two retinoblastoma mutations happening in the same cell is very low. So again, we have a big number and a small number. Here, it's a small number and a big number, but the net effect is roughly the same. Now, I mentioned that retinoblastoma, the protein, has a lot of tasks. It actually re regulates aspects of cell growth and division in many different cell types, and it's been found to interact with many, many proteins. There's about 60 proteins here that retinoblastoma interacts, the protein retinoblastoma interacts with. And here's a diagram showing all of the interaction that goes on that are influenced by retino, the retinoblastoma protein. This is another example of the kind of gene network that explains why every genetic difference affects many different phenotypic differences. So we've reviewed some relationships and terminology that we first brought up in Module 4, and we've introduced two new terms, familial and sporadic. These terms don't just apply to cancer risk. They can also apply to other um, genetically specified phenotypes, especially ones where there's um, incomplete what's called penetrance. Remember the term penetrance from module four as well, where in some cases individuals inherited a genetic predisposition to this, to the trait, and in other cases it arose spontaneously by a new mutation.
We've introduced the two-hit model for cancer initiation using the retinoblastoma gene as an example because, because single people with a single mutation in retinoblastoma have such a high frequency of cancer. It forms a very good demonstration of the model. And we've explained why inherited heterozygous mutations in genes that limit cell growth can be risk factors risk factors for the development of cancer. Coming up next, we're going to extend this analysis to cases where the relationships are a little more difficult to decipher, and that's the BRCA1 and BRCA2 alleles that cause a high risk of breast cancer. I hope to see you there.